Hey, Chachacos, it's me, the main slime of this whole place. Akewood is a webcomic that started in 2001 and ended... Well, that's a bit more complicated. The ending of Akewood was gradual, new strips came out slower and slower. Sometimes the creator, artist, and writer of each strip, Chris Onstad, would get random bursts of inspiration or motivation. He'd come back for a while, announce a new regular schedule, fail to meet that schedule, and then disappear for a while more until gradually... It just stopped happening altogether. Since there's been no update since 2016, I feel comfortable saying that it's likely we may never get more Aquid strips, and that's okay. They had a solid 15-year run off and on, and I think that's pretty respectable, all things considered. For the record, Calvin and Hobbes only ran for 10 years. Aquid bills itself as a temporary diversion on the road to the grave. It can't last forever. It shouldn't. And there's still plenty of material to go through already. Thousands of comics, hundreds of vlogs written from most of the main characters' points of view, and a few of the secondary or tertiary characters' points of view as well. A long-running advice column written in the voice of one of the characters. There's even an Aquid cookbook with recipes created by and informed by each character, though it is sadly out of print even though I want it very badly. There has never been, and likely never will be, anything like Akewood. So much of its DNA is a product of its time, as one of a handful of webcomics around the turn of the millennium that really took off. The idea of fictional characters, all in the same world, maintaining blogs which shared the same fictional continuity was something that was genuinely innovative and exciting back then. Now, even the idea of a personal blog feels kind of antiquated, like, who does that anymore? Nowadays, you'd see them all on Instagram or something, and that just feels less personal and feels like some of the magic would be lost in translation there. Akewood follows a group of small animals, teddy bears, and robots as they traverse the underground of California, a secret network of talking animals and toys. And it's also not even slightly about that, because the strip sets all that stuff up and very quickly abandons it to become a less high-concept slice-of-life comedy, where all of the characters just act like regular people that you might know, sometimes in silly situations, but usually just hanging out, drinking some crispy Stellas and eating nachos. Akewood is difficult to recommend, not because I don't think it has aged well or I don't think people would find it funny, but because it's really hard to explain the appeal of it without sounding like you're having a genuine mental health crisis. Starting to read Akewood is an investment. Each character speaks in a very particular dialect that can be completely impenetrable to new readers. Like here, when Roast Beef mocks Ray's beard, saying, That thing is so hell of wispy, a spider covets. Furthermore, Onstad often writes things in a deliberately obscure way, where characters imply feelings and thoughts more complex than they're actually saying out loud. Roast Beef, the depressed cat, is often said to have come from circumstances. You don't need to be told what that means. You can infer. Take a look at this comic where Ray steps in dog shit and he's immediately delighted. He sends a photo to his best friend Roast Beef, reminding them that this is like old times. He's just so excited to step in dog shit. And at first, that feels like such a non sequitur, like the joke is that he's happy about something that most people would find disgusting. But if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Ray, the consummate optimist, doesn't get mad. The dog shit just brings back happy memories for him of previous times that he stepped in dog shit. And when I read this, the logic of it struck me as, oh yeah, because you're more likely to step in dog shit as a kid. That's why he's happy. It reminds him of being a kid when you would step in dog shit. And so well conveyed is that logic that I never really thought about how that's not true at all. There's nothing about childhood that makes you step in dog shit more. Or this one, where Ray attempts to justify buying a Harlequin Halloween costume by saying a Harlequin symbolizes a clown? That says so much about the way Ray views the world. Like, it, he has to phrase it like it symbolizes a clown. That, that makes it sound more meaningful to him. And the art style is also hideous. Which is not to say that Onstad is a bad artist. He's not. It's just the thin line work with no variation in weight, stark black and white color palette with gray halftones, and tiny, tiny print looked way better on the smaller resolutions it was designed for. Like, if you look at the desktop backgrounds available to download on the Aquid homepage, there isn't even a 1080p option, let alone a 4K option. The highest resolution is 1600 by 1200, a 4x3 aspect ratio like TVs from the 90s. The characters also look really stiff. They, they look as though they were all copied and pasted from a few slightly modified still images. And they probably were, and this is especially problematic during action shots where characters are doing complicated movements. Also, the strips aren't really shareable like most comic strips are, like almost none of them have a punchline per se. Just a few funny lines within that might require you to decode the Byzantine language of the characters who you also have to be intimately familiar with. 
Take, for example, this comic. Roast Beef presents Ray with a prototype of his Cards for Guys business. Each single panel, aside from maybe one or two, could be the punchline in any other comic. Huh? What's this? Just open it, dude. Weird, is he arresting me? Is this a friend's arrest? Dog, it must feel sick as hell to receive a card from a dude. Ain't this just sick as hell? Oh, our Cards for Guys idea from yesterday. Man, did this throw me. My fight or flight was racing, but it could put together no conclusion about what was happening here. Right, I figure this is basically the only card I ever need to have in my dude to dude card line because no guy will ever get used to getting a card from another guy. And since you don't sign it, dudes can pass these cards around for generations, which is nice. No, they gotta sign it, because you need them buying new ones. Oh, good point, but, um, I mean, I, I didn't sign the card in the conventional manner, since that is, like, way too bearing of the emotions. Draw your preferred mag light. Three cell D, best haft, most pleasing proportions. What's the punchline here? So if you want to get the jokes, you have to be familiar with the characters, but... Where do you even start? If you ask 10 Akewood fans where to start reading Akewood, you'll get 12 different answers. You could just start at the beginning, but that wouldn't give you a very accurate impression of what the strip ends up becoming. Early Akewood strips are like gag-a-day anti-comedy. It's, it's not what the strip is known for. None of the characters behave like they should, and it takes a while for it to find its footing. You could start reading when the strip introduces Ray and Roast Beef, who would become its de facto stars shortly thereafter. But even then, they don't really act like you'd expect them to when you know them a bit better, and it kind of gives you an off impression of them. Like, Ray is intimidating when he's first introduced, which is not Ray. Some people will tell you to skip to their favorite story, and it's always the same story, don't worry, we'll get to it. But that story is wildly out of step with the rest of the comic, and you'd miss out on the full context by reading it first. For my money, the best place to start is the first story arc in the main page's Jump to a Story Arc drop-down menu. The Party. It introduces the principal cast, gives everyone a moment to shine, and this is where the tone of Akewood really starts to develop. Be warned though that Akewood has a lot of problematic elements. There are some highly insensitive jokes, particularly at the expense of Asian Americans, the disabled, and queer people just in general. Expect a lot of slurs, and not just like some of the iffy ones, like some of the real bad ones. I'm not going to excuse any of that. It's the type of nastiness you'd expect from a comic that mostly ran in the early 2000s. There are also no female characters whose lives aren't defined by a man. Let me run you through a list of recurring female characters in Aquid. Are you ready? See if you can catch a pattern. Roast Beef's wife, Molly. Ray's on-again, off-again girlfriend, Tina. Ray's mom. And... <sighs> Philippe's friend from Japan named Ultra Peanut, who speaks like Mickey Rooney. In breakfast at Tiffany's. Yikes. So given all of this, why bother, right? Well, you're just gonna have to take my word for it that these talking cats and their friends who are toys are some of the most fleshed out characters you will find anywhere and have voices that are stronger than anything else I've ever read. And I know how that sounds. I know how I sound when I say that I've never seen better character writing than in some esoteric webcomic from 2001 nobody's ever heard of about talking cats eating nachos, but stick with me here. Let's start with Cassandra Roast Beef Kazanzakis, because he's probably the most relatable character. Roast Beef, as mentioned earlier, comes from circumstances. His parents were neglectful, abusive, and often absent. He was dirt poor and left to fend for himself. In this comic, He's fighting with his girlfriend, later wife, Molly, about tacky onesies he bought for a friend's baby shower with inappropriate sayings. She says, I'd like to know what you got dressed in as an infant if you think these are acceptable. Roast Beef stares off into the middle distance, thinking of some childhood trauma. We see him as a baby, wrapped in an empty Wonder Bread bag, with a power cord around his neck, on the floor, crying. And his life doesn't get much better as an adult. Still desperately poor and living in a trailer with his equally abusive grandma, Grandma K. Beef is a nervous wreck, horribly depressed, riddled with anxiety, and lacking any and all sense of self-worth. He's the guy who sucks, and he has depression. Take a look at his reaction when Molly gives him a nice new shirt. At first, he's happy and confident in how he looks, but he starts to imagine his friends lashing out at him, telling him he's so arrogant for liking how he looked and how he really blew it this time. And in a fit of terror, he buries the shirt in the backyard so nobody will know he has it. A lot of early story arcs revolve around Beef's depression. He steals a rocket ship and goes to the moon to be left alone. In his own words, he'll be able to think about computer programming forever when left alone. 
to be away from everyone on Earth so that he can think about computer programming. Not to do it, just to think about it. He's eventually lured back with the promise of a porno where the actress has the rudest tits. Or when he steps inside a Volvo once owned by Robert Smith of The Cure and is immediately overcome with its totemic power of despair, having been more susceptible to it than other characters. And beyond these silly stories, there are also little glimpses into how it affects him day to day. Like when he lets a friend borrow his sunlight lamp and his seasonal affective disorder makes him so depressed that he can't finish biting through a piece of toast. An image I found so relatable that I used it for the thumbnail of my video about my own struggles with depression. In case you were wondering what the hell that was, now you know. Or when his anxiety is depicted as him imagining unplaceable Tetris pieces, which is both hilarious, perfectly in character, and an incredible visual metaphor that conveys the feeling of anxiety perfectly. Oftentimes, the comics will portray him lying on the floor, staring at the wall, and other characters are just so used to this behavior, they don't even comment on it, they just walk over him. His demeanor is very placid, reasonable, soft-spoken. Roast Beef's dialogue is always written in a smaller font than everyone else, as though the text itself is mumbling. He doesn't like it when people make a fuss and tends to just go with the flow whenever he's roped into one of his friend's zany schemes. But at the same time, he has a rebellious streak. He detests people putting on airs, dislikes formality, and wants to live very simply. He will not be told how to behave. Contrast Beef with his best friend, the strip's breakout character, Ray Smuckles. I am Ray Smuckles, and it is today that is not a problem. Thank you, Rose Beef. Ray is the polar opposite of Beef in every respect. Supremely confident, charismatic, and optimistic, life always goes Ray's way. He gets the things he wants easily with zero effort. He's a hedonist. He needs to be the alpha in every situation. He's obsessed with luxury and conspicuous consumption. And on paper, that sounds like a really unlikable character. Ray is a lot of things, but he is not difficult to like. Ray sees the best in every situation and in every person. He can sum up a person's strengths in an instant and can make pretty much anyone rich overnight with his insights. He's loyal, doting, and obsessed with providing a good time for his loved ones. He also has this infectious joie de vivre. Without the burden of self-doubt, he's able to fully enjoy any pursuit he puts his mind to. My personal favorite example is when his friends install software to spy on his computer, only to discover that he set his desktop background to a picture of Mount Everest and shrunk down a window with an image of a motorcycle in it so that he can make it jump the mountain over and over. Or when he gets so excited about the 2,000 flushes he put in his toilet, turning the water blue, that he throws a party in his bathroom to celebrate. This, incidentally, leads to my favorite Akewood strip. I have a signed copy of this comic that sadly is in another province at the moment because I, I, I would love to show it off. So many funny things happen in such quick succession in this comic. It's the perfect demonstration of the genius of Eggwood's writing. Ray gets way too high at the toilet party. He starts thinking about pots and pans and history, but eventually gets bummed out thinking about what it looks like to watch a man die. He hides under the table and his mood starts to plummet. His friend Theodore approaches and asks whether they should order some food. And just pay attention to the way that Onstad uses panels with no dialogue to build the awkwardness of the scene. Three panels with only the slightest movement. Ray turns his head, Theodore walks away. You really get the sense of how neither character knows what to say here. And when Theodore leaves, Ray thinks, I disappointed him. And that's the worst thing that could happen to Ray. The guy who cares about two things, status and taking care of his friends. Ray can't handle the idea that he'd disappoint anyone, so he has to fix it right away, but he's also very high, and he can't quite figure out how to do that. So he thinks, maybe soccer? Soccer's a thing friends do. That's the type of thought you have when you're very high. He calls Theodore on his cell phone instead of just crossing the room to talk to him because he just can't face that right now, and Theodore tells him he doesn't really like soccer. And Ray is immediately angry with himself for not knowing his friend better. He should have known Theodor doesn't like soccer. Theodor listens to The Cure. The Cure and just who might listen to them is a topic that Akewood touches on a lot. So Ray decides to get a piece of driftwood to remind Theodor of eternity, writes The Cure on it, and hands it to Theodor saying, Here man, I'm sorry about all that. We cool? And the last panel is just Theodor looking at Ray, expressionless. And that last panel is the funniest goddamn thing I've ever seen. It says so much without saying anything. Sometimes I think about that panel out of nowhere and I just start laughing. 
Put yourself in Theodore's shoes here. Imagine what this moment looks like to him without knowing what Ray is thinking. What the hell is happening? Why is he getting this? What does it mean? Why does it have the cure written on it? Why does Ray think that Theodore is mad at him? All of that from one panel with no dialogue. You know that feeling you get with close friends where they just have to shoot you a look and you know exactly what they're thinking? Akewood gives you that feeling with fictional cats and toys. And since the characters are so well fleshed out, and since they spend so much time in social situations with one another, you get the feeling you're seeing them at parties, getting to know them in dribs and drabs. And all of them feel like archetypes of people you already know. Tell me you don't know two people like Beef and Ray, who are also best friends. If you don't, ask yourself if you and your best friend are Ray and Beef. Or someone like Philippe, an innocent kid who believes whatever people in authority tell him to who's excited by strange things and has weird, half-cocked ideas about the world. He writes stories where he defeats the Mafia by convincing them to drink more water because it makes them less cranky, saying, I get very nice on this stuff. Or Theodore, the perpetually down-on-his-luck everyman who tries to be the voice of reason when things go wrong, even though his own life is a fucking mess. Theodore acts as a stand-in for Onstad himself, except when Onstad's literal stand-in is around. It gives us a little insight into how he sees himself, a talented, slightly haughty guy with a lot of problems. Someone who thinks he's the most reasonable guy in the room, usually is, but is also very quick to anger over sometimes very trivial things. And that familiarity makes the jokes land way harder. I had to leave my office a few times rereading strips for this video because my fiance was trying to focus on work and was getting distracted by how much I was laughing. Over the 14 years I've been a fan of this comic, I've probably reread the entire catalog a dozen times or more, and each time I end up laughing out loud pretty constantly. But sometimes, Akewood tells a different kind of story. Sometimes it's a romance, like Roast Beef and Molly's Wedding. Sometimes it's horror, like the eerie performance of Cartilage Head or when Philippe is kidnapped by the serial killer Nice Pete. And in one notable instance, it was an action story. I'd like to describe my favorite Akewood story now. The one that if you know Akewood, you've been wondering when or if it would come up. I'm talking, of course, about the great outdoor fight. A story that is equal parts exhilarating, hilarious, genuinely kind of inspiring and touching. It's not like anything else in Akewood's list of stories, and it goes to show how the tone of this comic could effortlessly flip on a dime. Word of warning, I'm gonna spoil the whole thing, so skip to the time code below if you'd like to go in fresh, which I highly recommend that you do. Also, gonna be a lot of violence in this story. Starts with Ray getting a visit from Todd, the vulgar lowlife squirrel. He pitches Ray an idea about manufacturing penises for cars to go along with truck nuts. Ray expands this idea to give cars all sorts of genitals, so that people can imagine their cars having sex with one another, as we all secretly wish to do. Also, to add sex organs to other things, like cell phones. And all is going well. That is, until Todd borrows Ray's phone and accidentally calls his mom and lets slip that he and Ray are in business together. Ray's mother visits him, and Ray plies her with alcohol so that she won't ask about his business and he doesn't have to explain that he's putting testicles on cell phones. She gets on the subject of Ray's father, Ramsey's Luther Smuckles. She let slip that he had won the Great Outdoor Fight under the pseudonym Rodney Leonard Stubbs. The Great Outdoor Fight is a competition where 3,000 men enter into a three-acre field and fight until only one remains. Within the story, the Great Outdoor Fight is well known, and Stubbs is a legend. Characters react in awe when they discover that Ray is his son. Ray immediately decides that he must, and therefore can, win this year's Great Outdoor Fight. It is his destiny. Now, what you have to understand about Ray is that he's not exactly tough. Ray's doctor tells him that he's pre-diabetic and to exercise to lose some weight, but he runs like a mile and complains about it the whole time as though it were torture. He drinks like a fish, though he has since thankfully gone to rehab and sobered up, and smokes hella weed. He's not sure if when push came to shove, he'd be able to execute a cow to get its hamburgers. And there are no rules in the great outdoor fight. Horrible violence, up to and including murder, are expected and encouraged. Ray's desire to go inside and fight is ridiculous. It's foolhardy. He'd be lucky to survive. But he has one advantage. His best friend, Roast Beef, is a scholar of the great outdoor fight. He knows all the competitors' strategies and makes it his mission to help his main dog win the fight. He even hacks into the fight's database, entering himself into the competition so he can advise Ray the whole time. The great outdoor fight does not end in a draw, and if one man does not emerge victorious, they call out the jeeps. You do not want the fight to end 
with the Jeeps. Beef Seeds Ray's reputation and finds easy targets for him to establish himself as a force to be reckoned with. Gradually, something unlocks within Ray, a latent fighting ability that he didn't know he had. He goes into fugue states where he starts kicking people's ass. When a cowboy threatens leadership of the gang he's accrued, Ray rips the man's fucking face off. Ray is shaken by his actions, staring at the blood on his hands. This echoes his father's nickname, the man with blood on his hands, but now Ray has gotten his hands dirty and he's not sure he can handle it. But Roast Beef is there for him. He consoles him, telling him the cowboy survived his injuries and it's only going to be good for him. He's going to use it to promote his music. The men in the fight signed up for this. They know what they're doing. And on the second night, the leaders of gangs are invited to either share whiskey and chicken with their men or eat alone. Ray chooses to eat alone because the loyalty of men who are so easily swayed is not worth much to him. Roast Beef recognizes this as the same choice his father made, and few men do. Alone with his whiskey, Ray breaks down, terrified of what will happen to his relationship with Roast Beef after he's forced to kick his ass. But he can't let someone else do it. They might hurt him too badly, and the fight can't end in a draw. His last thought before passing out is that maybe Beef knows this, and he asks himself, is he really that much of my dog? But when he wakes up, he finds out that Roast Beef was attacked and knocked senseless by a rival gang. He's out of the fight. Ray finds the gang, and one by one, he turns them into, quote, cowboy sauce. All of this, it turns out, was just a ruse by Beef, who is still on the grounds, just to get Ray more fights under his belt. He wanted to secure Ray's legend, and knew nobody would respect him for winning just three fights before being declared the champion. And as the last few men are eliminated, it comes down to just Ray and Beef. They discuss the fact that Ray will have to kick his ass. Beef, in fact, is that much of Ray's dog. He says this will secure Ray in the Stubbs' legacy. The man so raw, he beat down his best friend. But Ray's troubled. This isn't his victory. Beef is just as much the champion as he is. Beef's accepted this all throughout. He just wanted to see the fight, and he's gotten to do that. And over a tearful discussion while sharing a bottle of brandy, Ray's father visits them at the fence. He tells them that the people running the fight will not accept Roast Beef just laying down for Ray. Ray has to beat him up for real until he can't crawl away or else they're going to send out the Jeeps. You do not want the fight to end in the Jeeps. Ray is left in an unwinnable position. He either kicks his best friend's ass or they both get killed by the Jeeps. His friend, who at the drop of a hat entered into this fight just to prop him up, his best dog from old times. He has one hour to make a decision or the decision will be made for him. And so, heartbreakingly, we watch as Ray is forced to beat Beef up. He destroys him and it's brutal. And you can see the look in Beef's eyes that says their friendship will never be the same. Wait, actually, no, that's not what happens. Instead, he says, fuck those guys. The hell they're gonna say how this fight is won. Bring on the Jeeps. Why should the fight get to decide how the fight is won? Become the ruling body. The men in the tower send out the Jeeps. Ray and Beef stand them down. They light the remaining brandy on fire, throw it at a Jeep, which they then commandeer. They find a gun inside, shoot the men driving the other Jeeps off the road. They bring the walls of the fight down and burn it to the fucking ground. They decide how their story ends, not anyone else. And they decide this is a two-man victory, that they are inseparable, and together, nothing can stop them. On the long drive home, Ray asks Beef if he thinks his father is proud of him. Beef says that Rodney Stubbs, who is known for breaking the rules, and now Ray has completely smashed the rules, obliterated them. Their every move is the new tradition. And who would have thought that this story could end that powerfully. That a story about a man who has no business winning a fight, finding a hidden brutality within him, only to discover what truly makes him strong, stronger than anything, is love and brotherhood. A man seeking his legacy, his birthright, finds that he has to blaze his own path. The story has taken quite a few twists and turns, and it's hard not to get invested in the central conflict of Ray having to kick Beef's ass. When I first read this in 2006, I was on the edge of my seat. I was genuinely worried about how it would end, and I was floored when it all came together. And I'm willing to bet that you've already forgotten that it all began with a squirrel convincing Ray to put testicles on cell phones, didn't you? See, that's Akewood. You never know what kind of story you're going to get, or how it's going to make you feel. More often than not, you're going to laugh. But Onstead isn't afraid to throw an emotional curveball at you. Maybe you'll learn a little bit about Roast Beef's abuse, 
how he spent Christmas Eve 1981 alone in a laundromat. Maybe you'll see him come to grips with the fact that he deserves love, that he's a regular man, and sometimes a regular man does a regular thing like marry somebody good. Maybe Ray will start a new business selling extremely clean tacos, or maybe he'll prove himself a coward who would desert a dying man. Sometimes the day strip has nothing to do with the story whatsoever. It could be Beef and Theodore acting out the assassination of Abraham Lincoln while standing on Roombas. It might be a nightmare one of the characters is having. It might be a Fuck You Friday where just the characters find reasons to say fuck you to people. And folks, today is a Fuck You Friday. Why not take old Fuck You out for a spin? You'll be glad you did. Clearly, Akewood means a lot to me. Right now, I'm about to make a huge change in my life. I'm about to get married, which is why I chose a topic for this video that would require zero research on my part. I have most of Akewood committed to memory at this point. And this might sound strange, and it might just be the nostalgia talking, but something about me growing a little and putting aside a part of my life has made me take stock of what's important to me. A couple of weeks ago, some very old friends of mine gave me this, a signed illustration of Ray and Beef riding away from the fight, saying, our every move is the new tradition. And it reminded me of this story, and I couldn't help but draw the parallel in my mind. Not many of us will ever stare down the jeeps of the great outdoor fight, but all of us, at some point, have to break away from tradition and make our own way in the world. We have to see the inertia pushing us in one direction for what it is, and decide that we will not allow it to decide for us, that we are the authors of our own lives. But even as we do, we're still part of the community, and all of us depend on our friends and our loved ones, the people around us, imperfect as they may be. See, that's something else that I love about Akewood, that I get to share it with people, that when they get past all of the things which make it impenetrable and find the same joy in it that I do, I know they're my people. I cherish this little comic, I cherish these characters, and I hope that I've convinced at least some of you to look past its rough edges and see the brilliance underneath. Hey Trachacos, welcome to the Eyeball Zone. Here in the Eyeball Zone, we got hella small leftist projects all under subbed and such, and we get rude eyeballs all up in their zone. I tell you, this is the business. I don't like police, haven't since old times, but what do I know? I'm some knucklehead. Maybe it's a hard job, who's to say? I'll tell you who. That dang dad, a reformed cop who details in depth how he was conditioned into viewing the civilian population as less than human. If you've ever wondered how cops can justify the horrible shit they do, this video will help you understand that. Be warned though, this is a guy talking about horrible shit that he himself did, and that might not be something you want to subject yourself to. Luckily for you though, I got a second eyeball this week, as I said that I would oh so long ago. You know, in these troubled times, it's good to have something uncomplicated to bring us comfort. Something we can use to escape all the big, heady problems of the world. Like Queer Eye and Netflix, for example. <laughs> just kidding. Queer Eye has some real problems and fucked up ideas and situations, and if you'd like to see a level-headed examination of the way that that show might fail to live up to its stated intentions, check out this video from Solari, Queer Eye, Healing Through Consuming, which I tell you is just the dickens of a video essay. Do you have a tidy leftist project that you think can hang with the dirtiest eyeballs in town? Go ahead and shoot an email over to thoughtslimeeditor at gmail.com with much information. And the word eyeball somewhere in the subject line and maybe you and the eyeballs can pop open some crispy Stellas, burn one, and watch Braveheart. I'm telling you, that action is just so crunchy. And that's enough of me talking like that. Hello, it's me, Thoughtslime. Thanks for watching my video. I hope you liked it. If you did, Please press the like button and also subscribe here for more videos every Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Except maybe next week. There's probably not going to be a video next week because I'm going to be on honeymoon. And this is the first time in 72 straight weeks that I've missed a Friday. And I'm, it's, look, that's life. Sometimes you got to put your honeymoon first. You know this. Don't fret, my pets. If you have, if you, if, if what you need is more of my videos, then you can get another dose of vitamin slime over at youtube.com slash scaredycatstv where I talk about horror movies every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or the Mega Slime Entertainment Zone at youtube.com slash Mega Slime Entertainment Zone where I upload video game footage nominally every day right now on a bit of a hiatus. I'm, I'm going to get back to it. Don't worry. It's going to happen at some point. Also, I live stream every 8 p.m. on Thursdays 
at uh, that's also Eastern Standard Time, that 8 p.m. that I mentioned a minute ago. Um, and also, there's uh, thank you to all of the patrons that paid for this, this job I'm doing, the work that I'm doing, how good I'm doing this read right now. They paid for that at patreon.com slash thoughtslime. Some of the drawings that you see here are the people that did that. And that's, um, whew. I think I'm done now. I think I'm done saying the things I need to say. <laughs>